Oh, hi, I'm the heretic. Pollution. Byproducts of commerce that, when disposed of wherever, disrupt the local environment. Things like wrappers that get thrown away or the smoke a factory puts out. Come on, you all know what pollution is. Pollution implies that it's a detriment to local ecologies, non-native materials causing damage to the environment. The classic example being fish in the ocean being caught in plastic can rings and dying. This is a problem because the environment of planet Earth has value. There is value in the raw materials extracted from the state of nature, wood from forests, maple syrup, fruit from animals hunted such as deer or crabs, activities from nature such as surfing or snowboarding, or even simple natural aesthetics. Hundreds of thousands of people a year pay money to visit Yellowstone National Park, and you can be certain there are people who prefer living in undeveloped areas if only because they prefer the peace and seclusion. I know this because I'm speaking for myself. The reasons nature is valued are infinite, as our imagination is infinite. So we can see where the environmentalists are coming from. They see the degradation of something they value and wish to put a stop to it. Who are we to say they're wrong when all value is subjective? But what's objective is the destruction of the value of the environment through pollution. Nobody can reasonably argue that pollution isn't happening. One example of industrial pollution is the Chicago Stockyard. In the 1850s, they were the largest slaughterhouse in the area. However, not every part of the animal was useful. The question was, once you have the meat, what do you do with the rest of the carcass? They simply tossed it in the Chicago River. You might imagine how horrible the city must have smelt at the time, how poorly this affected people's health, and any reasonable person would call it an ecological atrocity. The government tried to solve the problem. In 1871, Government engineers tried to divert the river into the Illinois River to prevent the detritus from flowing into Lake Michigan, at least. It didn't work. What did end up working was the stockyards finding new uses for animal products, which for them meant more products to market. I'll spare you the details, but the result is that as more parts of the animals were being sold, it increased their profits and lowered their industrial pollution. This miracle wasn't the result of any government mandate or bureaucratic pressure. They developed it on their own, and the consequences of their seeking a profit is what helped the environment. This isn't a fluke accident, either. Even in our corporatist market economy, there are still plenty of examples of technological innovation that both made industry more profitable and solved major ecological issues. Innovations in wood preservatives reduced the demand for wood, and thus the need to cut down trees so frequently. Whale oil was more efficient than wood for burning, which further preserved forests, and the discovery of crude oil under the ground innovated whaling nearly completely out of existence. And what we know as gasoline, or petroleum to my European viewers, was originally a waste product of oil refining until Mr. Rockefeller and his Standard Oil Company found a new way to use it. With it, we keep the engines of our automobiles running, which themselves solve the problem of horse manure and carcasses littering city streets. None of this was done out of the goodness of their hearts. They did it because they wanted to make money. Granted, I don't have a crystal ball into the hearts and minds of people who have been dead for decades, but industrial pollution is not profitable. Regardless of their intentions, the environment was helped as a result. With entrepreneurship, pollution will be innovated out of existence. Want a modern example? Technological innovation has turned landfills into sources of energy, to the point that in order to keep the heat on, Sweden is paying Norway for literal trash. So why did Chicago stockyards dump in the Chicago River in the first place? Well, nobody owned the river. It was held in common. And when nobody owns something, anyone is able to do as they like to it. This is known as the tragedy of the commons. Put simply, 
your incentive is to make as much use of the commons as quickly as possible before someone else does. Logging companies would be incentivized to deforest entire areas they own in common with other logging companies before they do it. Conversely, areas that logging companies privately own will not be deforested and instead replanted to allow for sustainable lumber production. In the Chicago Stockyards example, the Chicago River, if somebody else owned the river, or at least a portion of it, then the stockyard would only be able to dump them if the owner wanted them to, such as through contract, paying the owner for dumping rights. However, the rotting carcasses and parts would still flow downstream and leave the owner liable to pay damages, making any such contract prohibitively expensive. Even if the stockyards themselves owned that part of the river, they would have to pay those damages. And even if they owned the entire river, they'd still be sued by property owners near the river who have to deal with the offensive smell and the damages to businesses who rely on the river for commerce. Thus, under a system of private property rights and customary law, the stockyards would have no incentive to dump to begin with. Customary law was how this issue was resolved in the past. Claimants who proved they were adversely affected by, say, air pollution, would go to court and have the offender pay restitution. Rather than people seeking compensation for the violation of their property rights, the government has created an alternative to customary law. The modern system of law places the government as the claimant on people's behalf and seeks restitution for themselves, even if they weren't affected themselves, and the actual claimants are left high and dry. Especially since more often than not, legislation is written by special interests on the business's behalf. The result is situations like in London, Ontario, the Orger World Waste Treatment Plant releases an atrocious order which has been an ongoing problem in the area since 2007. Not because the government hasn't tried to do something, in fact, they've fined Orga World repeatedly. They've been fined for hundreds of thousands of dollars, but this hasn't dissuaded Orga World from continuously breaking the law. The system of authoritarian law has failed to prevent the violation of the people of London, Ontario's private property rights. Under customary law, Orga World and Chicago Stockyard would be held liable by the people, not the government, which is, at best, an uninterested third party. Property in London, Ontario was owned prior to the building of the treatment plant, and I hate having to keep specifying that London, Ontario's in Ontario, but I need to distinguish between the Canadian and UK cities. Anyways, property owners should have been compensated a long time ago, but authoritarianism crowds out this process, and as far as the government is concerned, as long as Orger World pays their fines, everything's just fine. As far as Orger World is concerned, these fines are just the cost of doing business. All the while, the status priesthood can pretend to be protecting people and the environment, even as it's just pocketing the money from its fines in this demented system of legal bribery. In the case of Chicago stockyards, no legal action will be taken against them as long as they don't exceed their maximum dumping limits and make their payoffs on time. Many environmentalists see such waste produced by industry and assume that commerce must be the problem. The restriction of commerce can only be taken by an authoritarian government, as any government with the power to prevent exchange is a government with no restrictions on its power, but I repeat myself. Anyways, authoritarian regimes have absolutely atrocious track records of environmental protection. Lake Karache was so polluted by the Soviet Union, simply standing on the shore for an hour would give a person a lethal dose of radiation. You could look to a more democratic government, but even then, you have disasters like the Environmental Protection Agency of the U.S. government accidentally dumping millions of gallons of toxic contaminants into the Animus River, turning it toxic and bright orange. Who gets compensated when the government pollutes? Certainly not the taxpayers, and the government gets tax money whether or not they screw up, so they have no incentive whatsoever 
to curb their incompetence, let alone pollution. In which case, unlike the market, whether or not the government does protect the environment is entirely dependent on the benevolence of politicians and bureaucrats, which is more often than not up for sale and not always for the best reasons. Large portions of Indiana's Yellowwood State Park were sold to Hamilton Logging of Sullivan County on November of 2017 for the price of just under $109,000, while conservationists offered $150,000. Politicians chose the loggers because the company and its workers will pay taxes. Their decision had nothing to do with the environment or who valued the land the most. It's all about power. Power like how the government, despite having no legitimate claim to the ownership of that land, were able to sell it somehow. Environmentalists, the government only cares about power. You don't need to be a diehard militant vegan envirofascist to care about the environment. On some level, we all want a clean planet. But we can't look to the government for these solutions. Their laws are, at best, a mild inconvenience to polluters. Abolishing property rights completely as socialists and communists are wont to do will achieve the opposite effect, as the tragedy of the commons informs us. If we're really serious about protecting the environment, if we want a lasting, sustainable environment that our hatchlings can grow and prosper in, what we need is an honest-to-goodness commitment to property rights. If you own the forest, then loggers should have no claim to cut it down. If you own a house and some factory opens up and produces smog, then they owe you compensation. The only reason we've made as much progress against pollution as we have today is because of property rights, even the nominal property that exists in our current status regimes. Entrepreneurs will be able to innovate away the need to pollute, However, as long as we have a top-down authoritarian legislative and judicial structure, we will never reach 0%. All the government will do is create unnecessary artificial scarcities that make things more expensive, makes it harder to innovate, and makes things worse for both producers and consumers. Now, maybe you don't agree with me. Maybe most of what I'm saying is just hogwash. Well, that's fine. Even if you disagree... Just try to imagine how many big polluters are subsidized by the government. Perhaps it's time we reconsider using the government to protect the environment and try voluntary association. Questions? Comments? Critique? How valuable is the environment to you? What is your favorite example of government pollution? Aside from the pollution of our minds through the government media complex and government schooling, leave a comment below. Support me on Patreon, like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.